PhD advisor, and I'm very happy to invite him here. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, it's uh, great to be speaking to um, predominantly the IIST audience because uh, I plan to go there for a long time, and it's a pleasure that um, at least I get to connect with all of you remotely. And uh, again, um, great to be here um, virtually. <laughs> Um, so I will start off with um, uh, my talk, which is about uh, challenges in RF and millimeter wave integrated circuit testing. And uh, as some of you might know, uh, integrated circuit testing is as important as integrated circuit design. And so it's very important for us to, uh, you know, look at the testing side of things, uh, perhaps even in the design phase itself, right? And uh, this results in significant cost savings and uh, does a lot of great things actually. And so today the purpose of this talk is to tell you a little bit about the commercial side of things, uh, what happens when you make a silicon integrated circuit working at RF, RF uh, frequencies and how do you include BIST? And I'm, I'm going to be briefly describing uh, the industry first uh, BIST, RF analog BIST subsystem in a product that um, I we included when I was at Qualcomm. And uh, then I will extrapolate or rather try to ex extrapolate what happens when you move to millimeter wave frequencies. Um, is it merely an extension of what we see at lower frequencies or is there something more that we need to worry about? And uh, so the talk will conclude with a listing of some future challenges um, that we might uh, face as we move from RF to millimeter wave or even in uh, in the frequencies that are considered high RF. So as you know, um, the CMOS RF uh, and millimeter wave space is quite broad. I mean, in our group, we like to uh, believe at least that we work between one and a hundred gigahertz, though much of our research is limited by our ability to transition a connector. And uh, <laughs> so this, this is what you know things fundamentally come down to. And so we in our group are able to measure things up to 67 gigahertz and that's why uh, you know, we typically don't claim that we do a lot of 100 gigahertz stuff unless we do it in simulation. But uh, in general, you will find that there are lots of commercial applications. Uh, you know, you have to go back a couple of decades to see how we all started off with GSM at 850 megahertz, which was not even a gigahertz. And then today you find the whole sub six gigahertz space populated with standards that we use on a daily basis, such as Bluetooth uh, and GPS. Uh, a lot of cell phone standards, and these are uh, continuously um, changing um, as we transition from one mobile standard to the other. Uh, as all of you know, we are transitioning heavily towards 5G. We also have things like the new radio application of 5G at 28 gigahertz, used to be an old radar band. We had 60 gigahertz where you see people, um, you know, turning the switch on and off. Um, for a decade and a half, people have been designing and then stopping the design and so on. Uh, applications have been fickle, uh, but this is still a band of interest. And 77 gigahertz, as many of you know, is a um, band of tremendous interest because a uh, um, lot of countries move their radar standards or radar um, uh, spectrum allocations to the 77 gigahertz band. And of course, beyond 100 gigahertz, you do sub terahertz imaging, amplification, and then you hopefully push everything to terahertz uh, sooner or later. Right. And one thing that has been responsible for all of this has been the um, increase in FTs of devices as we have scaled and made devices smaller and smaller. So if you look at the iPhone 5, which is essentially a 4G phone, but it shares a lot of the 5G features, we'll look at, um, we'll try to dissect the 4G phone a little bit. So if you look inside a 4G phone, you'll find that it has many radio components, right? So if you look at things that people make. People tend to think that as we have made chips, we have obviated uh, the need to have uh, many, many chips on a cell phone. On a smartphone, perhaps we can get away with a few, but that's not true. That, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, in fact, today, if you look at the power amplifier, which has always been a holy grail, we haven't been able to do good PAs and CMOS. In fact, Emmanuel's PhD was on PAs and he did some pretty aggressive PA design but he will also tell you how hard it is to design a mobile uh, power amplifier and integrate that on CMOS, right? It's still a holy grail. So if you open a smartphone, you find a bunch of PAs from companies like Skyworks and TriQuint, and they're all in the Siggy family and sometimes in the Silicon Germanium family. So 
But if you go to the heart of uh, what makes a smartphone today, you will find that it's more or less a three chip approach because for a long time, people said that you cannot integrate uh, um, everything on a single piece of silicon. You know, there were conflicting points of view. In fact, the silicon germanium by CMOS technology came into existence, as some of you know, because people said, oh, we are going to put everything on a single substrate, right? We will do all the heavy lifting RF type work with silicon germanium and all the signal processing with CMOS. But as it turned out, there are many, many other issues like isolation and how do you deal with coupling, which finally forced people to move the digital out. And today you will see that the latest generation smartphones typically have a front end RF. There is a modem which does a lot of the mixed signal work, uh, including A to Ds. And then finally, you have a microprocessor that, that does all the digital heavy lifting. And you might have some partitioning between these two, but the RF is kept separate, right? Now, if you look at um, commercial solutions, so uh, Qualcomm, for example, and I'm, I'm pretty sure even Emmanuel worked on the RTR 8600, uh, but, uh, you know, or one of its derivatives, one of its future derivatives. But if you look at one of these chips from a major RFIC provider, you'll find that there are many, many bands on a single piece of silicon. So this would be a die shot of an RFIC, um, a courtesy a company called Tech Insights that, you know, tears these things apart. And if you make a few observations, what you can see is that you pretty much have one radio required for every band. And you have five UMTS, five LTE, and four edge bands on this particular chip. This number also keeps changing depending on which product you're going to support, right? And you may also, on an RFIC like this, have some analog signal processing and control. And uh, test is very, very important, especially in the context of something like this, which will become clear in a few seconds, because um, you really have to test these things before you can ship them to your customers. The question is, the choice is yours. Do you want to invest huge amounts of test infrastructure in uh, testing every minute detail of these chips? Or do you want to come up with some superficial test that takes very little time, but gives you just as much information? Now. Uh, a small look at the commercial side of things. If you look at what it costs to make an iPhone, right? Many people don't realize this, that this is, you know, if you pick up, so this is slightly dated. I'm talking about an iPhone 6S here. Uh, people did a bill of materials analysis of an iPhone and found that uh, the iPhone 6, which uh, was, uh, you know, they found the bomb cost to be about $234. I don't know if this was the retail cost. But the bill of materials cost was 234. And then when they partitioned it, they found that about $127 of that 234 actually came from semiconductors, right? This is huge, as you know, because, you know, if more than half of your bill of materials is really made up of semiconductors, then it's very important that we take good care of these chips when we fabricate them and possibly test them thoroughly before we ship them to our customers. Right. And so if you look at previous generations, we probably had 50 plus chips addressing different requirements. Unfortunately, today we still cannot move to the three chips that I showed you, uh, you know, one for RF, one for mixed signal and one for digital. Uh, we also need the PAs and memory chips and all these things. But the count has significantly come down. But we know that most of the bomb cost is really made up of uh, semiconductors. And this is expected to continue as we move to 5G. Now, if you look at the bill of materials, this is again from one particular research teardown. Uh, you find that you know you have lots of things in here, like uh, what would be the manufacturing cost, what will be the bomb plus manufacturing. But I wanted to highlight a few semiconductors in here, just for your information. This is what happens when you open up your iPhone and you start to look at what's in there and how much does it cost, right? So you will find that the major blocks are really the memory, the processor, the wireless section, which consists of the baseband, the RF, and the power amplifier. And you would also have subsidiary wireless technologies, right, or uh, supporting wireless technologies. Like your smartphone has Bluetooth, it has wireless LAN. You will have PIMX, you know, they, they cost a lot of money. But uh, eventually, you know, for this particular model, they found that out of the total cost of about $200, about $85 uh, dollars was uh, from integrated circuits. And uh, so if you look at analog and RFICs out of that $85 semiconductor cost, right? About 55% of the IC cost was taken up 
by analog and RF, right? And analog and RF ICs, and this is very important, everybody thinks that most of the cost of semiconductor uh, chip, uh, most of the price of a semiconductor chip really is made up of the silicon fabrication cost. But that's not true. Nothing could, again, be further from the truth. This is about a third of the overall cost. So just to give you an idea of what that means, if your chip costs 100 rupees, then probably 33 rupees are really the cost of the die, right? Uh, the other 33 rupees are the cost of the package, and the last 33 rupees are the cost of testing the silicon, right? Which is where testing has become so important. So I will just uh, tell you about a few basic considerations related to the testing of RF transceivers. So this is a famous graph that was presented by Pat Gelsinger, who was um, chief technical officer at Intel. And this was way back in 1999, you know, the year I started my career. So it was like 20, 21 years ago. And uh, the International Test Conference, as many of you might know, is the premier conference in testing. And he gave a keynote address in which he flashed this graph. And again, this was one of those telling moments, right, where he said that, look, the cost of silicon per transistor is coming down, right? If you add up the billion transistors in the microprocessor today, the Pentium microprocessor, if you add up, the, if you take the cost of that microprocessor and divide it by um, billion transistors, you will find that the cost of a single transistor is probably uh, measured in millicents and microcents, perhaps even nanocents, right? This graph has been con continuously coming down. Whereas the test capital he observed way back so in uh, way back in 1999. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Is... Kindly so, mute the mic. Those participants, I request you to please mute your mic. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, then there is this uh, cost of test, right? And another thing that was observed by Pat Gelsinger was that uh, way back in 1999, that the cost of testing had more or less remained constant and it was supposed to stay constant. Maybe it would actually increase. So on a per transistor basis, the cost of testing, if you just spread it across the transistors, it was not changing. That means as you increase the number of transistors on a chip, the cost of test capital was proportionately increasing, keeping this graph flat. So he predicted that there would be something called a test doomsday, right? And he predicted that would be around the year 2012 when, um, you know, I think a lot of you remember that we predicted that the world would come to an end in 2012, right? So anyways, it didn't look like that, that date was 2020. But anyways, so um, jokes aside, I think um, the cost of testing has been flat and there was an inflection point. And another thing that was observed was that this is very capital intensive, that the, the act of testing a chip, right? So um, with that information, uh, I just wanted to tell you about a couple of test basics. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but um, many of you probably are old enough to remember that um, the Pentium 4 bug that was uh, there in the in, uh, Intel's, uh, I'm sorry, not the Pentium 4, the Pentium bug uh, was discovered way back, you know, uh, during the original Pentium chips days. And it was discovered, it was a very esoteric error. It was discovered by a professor of mathematics who was working with prime numbers. But, uh, you know, Intel did not come out and acknowledge and say, okay, we'll take the product back if you have a problem. And it ended up being a massive public relations dis disaster. And it resulted in a cost to the company of $475 million, almost half a billion in 1995. It had a huge impact on the company's finances. And uh, I remember when I joined Intel in 1999, four years had passed, but this was very fresh in the memory of a lot of people. You know, people were very careful. So what happens? When you design a chip, right, if you can find a bug in the chip at this point itself by doing wafer level, level probing, then you can catch it and throw away this chip. You haven't added much, much cost. But the moment you package this chip, right, you've added the cost of the package. And as I told you, it's about a third of the cost of the entire chip. So now you have added cost. And if you discover a problem here and throw it away, you have added some good stuff and thrown it away. Now, if you put it on a board, right, that's where the disaster happens. Because if you put it on a board and the board is found to be faulty, your chip is found to be faulty, and you've assembled the board uh, or even a full system, you're throwing away a lot of value. 
So it's very important in chip testing to test and detect faults early during the testing process so that you can save a lot of money that would be otherwise thrown away. A couple of other things that those of you doing digital design may have seen is that people have used design for testability for a long time where, uh, you know, typically microprocessors use combinational logic and they use uh, registers, right, to do uh, uh, clocked operations, synchronous operations. So some of these registers can then be reconfigured as a scan chain so we can scan in a sequence of bits. And using those bits, we can test the combinational logic, right? And this uh, a scan chain based mode of testing uh, generally is very effective, but, but very, very expensive because of external testers and long patterns. And there's a lot of signal processing and other compression techniques going on around the world to make these more efficient. On the other hand, another technique that has been adopted um, more recently is that of a built-in self-test, where you have a test controller on the chip. You put it on the chip. It's no longer an off-chip controller. The controller generates a stimulus. And with that, you test a sub-circuit, which could be a combination of sequential and combinator combinational logic. And then you would look at the response, and then you would determine if the, uh, the circuit is working or not. So the idea, this is where the idea of built-in self-test comes in, right? That you put all the test circuits inside the chip. Do not use expensive off-chip testers. Do minimal, make minimal use of them. And all these circuits can be tested with stimulus response pairs. And uh, one key thing is that when you put these circuits on a chip, the stimulus, the test controller, the response, you are going to take up silicon area. So a key thing is that the cost of including BIST should be less than the cost of savings due to BIST, right? Otherwise, you, you are in negative territory. And analog and RF BIST would require very similar consideration. So you're looking at the reuse of uh, system blocks so that you can uh, save area, uh, but you would still have a stimulus, you would have a response analyzer, and you would have a test controller. And of course, uh, you would like to keep the test interfaces digital. This is very, very critical because a lot of the infrastructure that is built in high volume industrial testing uh, really is built around digital testing. That means you can send patterns, ones and zeros. So why not keep the same interface? Do all of your analog crazy stuff inside the chip, right? So that uh, when the tester um, works on your chip, the tester just deals with ones and zeros. The interface doesn't change. You're not asking for more expensive equipment and everybody's happy, right? And you end up saving a ton of money, which is the ideal situation when you work in the industry, right? So now the biggest issue here is uh, the issue of the ship in the bottle, right? So we, we all know that it is very, very difficult to take a high quality spectrum analyzer, right? A measurement instrument and put it inside a chip that is, you know, smaller than your fingernail. So how do you put a spectrum analyzer in this thing, right? And perhaps what we can do is we, we will appreciate the fact, this is where, you know, analog and RF bis becomes very interesting. Perhaps we appreciate the fact on day one that we cannot really squeeze a high quality spectrum analyzer into a chip this small. However, what we can do is that if we know the limitations of our spectrum analyzer or any other measurement instrument, uh, perhaps we can exploit those limitations, right? And uh, come up with something creative that allows us to test the chip. The other appreciation you have to make is that when you are testing chips on an industrial scale, you are not interested in measuring gain to the third decimal place or the noise figure to the fifth decimal place. Nobody is interested in that. What people want to know is, is this chip okay or is it not okay? If it's not okay, I'll throw it away. If it's okay, I'll ship it to my customer after packaging it. And I want to take as little a time as possible in coming to that determination, right? I want to take milliseconds or microseconds to find out if the chip is okay or not okay, because I don't have all the time in the world. And the more time I spend on the tester, the more money I'm burning, right? So these are the considerations with which you have to design uh, an integrated BIS subsystem. And this is what we did at Qualcomm. And if you want details of this, you can read this um, general solid state circuits paper from 2011. We had finished the chip, I believe, in 2009. And uh, um, so uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge the help of my colleagues, Manas Behera, Mohammed Zaidan, Rick Chen, and Kenneth Barnett, uh, 
we were all on the team that designed uh, this first industry first chip um, that uh, included it was a product chip that included a full based uh, analog RF um, subsystem. So let me tell you a little bit about the test economics right before we jump deeper into this. So uh, I told you that when you uh, when you make a chip right the total cost is made up of the cost of silicon the cost of testing and the cost of packaging. Now let's break this down a little bit, right? Let's say that the cost of silicon is equal to the area that you consume on silicon, right? Multiplied by the silicon cost per unit area, which we call pi silicon here. Similarly, the cost of testing is uh, the time you take testing the chip multiplied by the test cost per unit time. This is a very important variable used by uh, people in the test industry. And this is again signified, I mean, represented by pi test. So if you look at the total cost of testing, that's equal to silicon area multiplied by cost of silicon per unit area, plus uh, test time multiplied by cost of testing per unit time, plus the cost of packaging, which for the time being we've kept as a fixed cost. Now let's assume that by using built-in self-test, we have been able to reduce the test time from t-test to t-test prime, right? And we come up with a ratio called test time reduction ratio, which is just the ratio of the new test time uh, and the old test time. So what is the new cost C prime? It is equal to the old silicon area that I had, plus remember that I have added best. And so I have more area. I'm taking up more area now, right? So the total area has gone up multiplied by the price of silicon per unit area. Also, uh, my total test time has now gone down. Remember, that's the whole intent of using best. And so it's gone down. So I've multiplied this by the TTRR, right? The test time reduction ratio. And this is multiplied by the cost of testing per unit time and the cost of packaging remains the same. Now, if I subtract one equation from the other, I get the cost delta. Ideally, I want to reduce the cost, right? And however, we'll look at a break-even point. This break-even point, when you set delta C to zero and equate this to zero, what this tells you is you come up with a value of A best, the best area, which we call A best zero. This tells you this is the maximum allowed area right that you can add to the chip with your built-in self-test circuitry because if you cross this then you're actually losing money right you're losing money because you have made your circuits too big and uh, although you're saving on testing time uh, you have grown the silicon so this is essentially your break-even point so this uh, sort of summarizes the whole cost economics of this now what we did was this was this is a die shot of our chip uh, our primary aim was we don't want to consume extra silicon area, right? We don't want to get close to this value of A best zero because otherwise we would be losing money. So what we did was we did reuse. And you know, if this was a chip that was done for mobile broadcast video way back in 2009, when people were looking at streaming video on their cell phones. Now, what we said is that there's a lot of stuff sitting on this chip which can be reused. For example, there is a full synthesizer which is being used you know, to generate the frequencies for the receiver. Can we reuse the synthesizer and then have a small block to condition the signal and put it on an analog bus so that every single circuit under test on the chip right, uh, could be uh, tested with that synthesizer output as a stimulus. Similarly, what we did was we used the existing digital external interface on the chip to bring in and out digital bits that would control our BIS system. So at the heart of the BIS system really was this particular block, which had a digital controller, it had interface, it had an A to D converter and a signal generator. The signal generator uh, essentially leveraged the existing synthesizer. Then it sent out a signal to the various blocks. We stimulated the blocks, we looked at the response, we brought this back again through a, this BIST analog bus. It was a three-wire bus. And then we uh, put it into an ADC. Again, this ADC was a reused ADC. Every chip has something called a housekeeping ADC that monitors various parameters and looks at the chip's temperature and all these things. So we thought, why not design the whole system around that? Because again, the idea was to keep the BIST area as low as possible, right? Purely commercial reasons. And again, we also used a fully digital bus to excite the various sensors and you know test the various circuits. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit more of a detail on how we did this. 
So suppose I had a circuit under test, right? And I had inserted a small um, BIST block in that circuit. I'll show you how small. So imagine that, you know, this is a full uh, mixer, right? This entire thing in here is a mixer. You can see that our BIST block was this small, right? The BIST controller was probably the biggest block in the hierarchy, this thing in here. And this was, uh, you know, it sat up here and was quite big. But every other BIST sensor cell was really small. And they could be distributed all around the chip, as you can see, these white rectangles. And their job was to help the testing process. And then there, was, uh, there were two buses, an analog bus and a digital bus that enabled this. So the idea is that you, know, you can provide a stimulus from the signal generator. You can make a switch. This is essentially an analog switch. And it is connected internally to 16 nodes in the circuit under test. And using the digital registers and logic and the digital bus, you can flip one of these switches, right? And you could apply a stimulus. Simultaneously, you could look at the response by flipping these switches. Some of these would measure DC response, and you would direct it directly to an, the, the centralized A to D converter. Sometimes you would want to measure, let's say, the envelope of a signal because you're performing an AC measurement. So you would have an envelope detector in which you would run the AC signal, find out the corresponding DC, and bring it back to the ADC. So the intent was to keep the specs on the ADC as low as possible and not do any AC sampling with the ADC, just measure low frequency DC, because that keeps everything uh, uh, controllable in terms of cost. So a typical switch in the sensor would look like this, where you know the, those of you who design RF switches probably know that you have a, something called a T-switch, where you use two uh, C, uh, CMOS pairs, essentially a uh, transmission gate-like structure, with a grounding uh, MOS device in between. This side would be stuck to the circuit. This would be the outside world side. And when you would turn on these two, then you would connect here. Uh, the challenge was really to keep the capacitance very low. And this becomes, this problem aggravates at millimeter wave frequencies because this is the dead capacitance. This is the source drain junction capacitance sitting in here. And if you add it to a node, you have to be very careful that it does not uh, degrade the circuit performance. Similarly, we had an envelope detector that worked on a very simple principle that you had an input voltage, it would get converted to a current through the current mirror, it, the charge would be dumped in this capacitor, and then you know, um, you would, this would go back into the feedback loop till the envelope was detected, and then this, this op-amp would cut off, and then this circuit would bleed out the charge slowly, and you would adjust the time constant to detect the envelope. This is how you would detect uh, the peak of the AC circuits. Now, we also had a signal generator. I won't go into the details in here, but we use some conventional RF techniques, basically, uh, to combine the on-chip synthesizer output with some uh, offsets that we generated from the reference clock, because you know every chip has a reference clock for the PLR. And that way, we were very creative with how we generated a bunch of signals and put them on the best bus uh, to test the chip. Now, let, let me give you a specific example of how we measure DC voltages, right? So we would, for example, uh, you know, uh, connect to these various nodes in the circuit. But before that, we would, um, you know, look at two resistors that were embedded in the chip uh, at every sensor. And we would find out the midpoint and measure this voltage. So even before we started doing a measurement, we would do a loop back, right? We would do a loop back, many types of loop backs. We would first measure the local ground. So one node would be assigned to a ground. We would measure the local power supply to make sure that the power supply in that uh, circuit under test was all right. Then we would measure the midpoint to make sure that process scaling went okay and the two resistors were okay. Then we would measure individual points. And this is very similar to taking a probe and probing inside your chip, but complex in the sense that this was done with the built-in self-test. And it provided a very quick verification of the chip, right? Um, so I'll show you how we did that. And, uh, you know, so similarly, you could do RF measurements, you know. So just to give you an example, suppose I was measuring uh, the gain of an amplifier, I would uh, apply a stimulus at the input and measure this input through an envelope detector. Then I would apply a stimulus. Then I would simply disconnect the input and connect the output with a switch. And that way, while I'm applying the stimulus, I would find out what's the peak at the input, what's the peak at the output, and based on that, I could get a pretty decent idea about the gain, right? 
this could also be moved across blocks. For example, one block in the chip could be the LNA and the other could be the mixer. And I could do this complex measurement, which was all digital. So this was the most beautiful thing about the system in the sense that all of these switches were opened and closed by sending digital words, right? And these digital words were all controlled by a central bus and we could uh, scan in the bits and we could do a measurement. And so uh, all these measurements had reasonable amounts of accuracy. The chip was implemented like this. So like I said, there was a central BIST controller. There were these distributed BIST blocks all over. Uh, and eventually we found that the BIST overhead was about 7.75% of the chip area. And I will show you at the end that you know this ended up being profitable for us. Uh, there was no power overhead because this entire thing was powered through a dedicated power supply, which was only used in the test phase and then grounded when we shipped to the customer, right? And uh, the signals were very delicately distributed across. You can see that we sort of built a coplanar waveguide-like structure with a slotted ground plane on the chip with differential stimuli and a response. Now, this is what I was talking about. You know, within 15 minutes of the chip uh, being back in our, um, in our lab from uh, the manufacturer, we were able to actually very quickly measure all the internal node voltages on the chip. And the designers had supplied the expected values and we were able to see the measured values and find out deviations. This is extremely useful because, you know, this is very similar to what the digital people call IDDQ testing. Those of you who are familiar with the terminology, you know that, you know, in every chip, uh, if, if you power up the chip and it doesn't sink the right amount of current from the power supply, a digital chip, then you know something is wrong. So very similar to that in an analog chip, we tried to create an IDDQ version of it saying that we are going to measure 100 nodes, you know, in a flash and tell you that, yeah, this chip is okay or perhaps not. Right. So this was a really nice thing that came. One cool thing that came out of this was this perturbation based testing, very useful in RF. So let me actually tell you about what this is. We came up with this idea. This is now, of course, patent protected, but we came up this, with this idea from the automotive industry, uh, you know, because uh, a South Korean group had looked at what happens when you're testing an engine, right? You don't know what is going on inside the engine. There are only some observation values that you can find out, right? But what you can do is you can perturb the engine, right? You can do this or that. It's kind of like, you know, just making the engine really angry. You're poking it and prodding it. And then based on that, you can generate a system transfer function, right? And uh, based on a set of observations and responses. So let's say that, you know, you have many variables and X1, X2, X3, these could be gains or DC bias points and you perturb them one at a time. By perturbation, I mean that the change will be very small. It has to be reasonably small. How small? We'll, we'll just talk about it in a second. So now if you keep perturbing these and keep looking at the output variable changes, right, which are like represented by delta y, delta uh, one, delta y, two, and so on, you can construct a model that relates the total change in the output to the perturbations in the input. And then you can predict what will be the delta y for an arbitrary combination of delta x, one, x2, and so on. Which means now that if the delta y that you get is outside the acceptable bounds, right? Then the system has failed testing. I don't need to know. Let's say that y is a noise figure. I don't need to know what is the noise figure. I just need to know that it is outside the acceptable bounds so I can throw away this chip. And this is very important. Remember that when you do high volume testing, your intent is not really to you know, do a research project where you can measure noise figure to the fifth decimal place. The idea is to very quickly determine if delta y is good or bad, right? So the key observation is that once you have developed the system model, you don't need to measure delta y again. You just need to measure the perturbation variables because with this, you can predict very easily if y is within bounds or outside. So just to give you an example, those of you from the microwave world, probably I think everybody's here from the microwave world, you've seen the freeze equation at some point or the other, right? Which relates the various stage gains and their noise figures to the overall noise figure. Now, what if I could represent a change, total change in the noise figure to individual changes in gain, G0, G1, G2, and so on, right? And then I can construct a model by perturbing amplifier gains one at a time. Right. And then I can measure the changes in the output noise figure and construct a model so that later on, 
All I need to do are, is to measure the changes in G0, G1, and GN, and so on. And I would find out if delta F is within acceptable bounds or not. Okay. If it is not, then I throw away the chip if I have that amount of confidence, right? So we had actually created a model. We found, you know, as a as a result of perturbation, um, and we found by modeling various process variations that um, we were able to predict the noise figure variation even for reasonably large perturbation. And I'll show you how large the perturbations were. So you know, when we went to about 15% perturbation in gain, that's when things started going out of control in terms of the error. But you know, as long as you keep uh, your variables within 15%, right? So if you have gain of stage one and you change it by say 10%, and based on that, you construct a model. In other words, if your delta G zero, gain of stage zero is 10%, right? Then you construct a model, which would essentially be, you know, just a matrix of all the partials. And, um, you know, so you could uh, find out what's the overall change in the noise figure at, um, you know, the various, uh, various stages. Uh, you know, so this is very similar to the Jacobian matrix that many of you have seen in math, right? And um, yeah, and this this is exactly what it does. It creates a model. Now, if you find that the perturbations become too large, then you have to go back and sort of, um, you know, uh, take more points. In other words, you know, find out more variables that will allow you to have smaller perturbations. And this worked very well, you know, for the model that we had developed. Uh, another thing is the evaluation of the test time and the test time reduction ratio. So this is, again, a very complex process. In the in interest of time, I'm going to avoid it. Uh, but this itself needs to be very carefully done. At the end of the day, this is the summary information, which shows you these are you know typical tests that you would do in an industrial environment in an RF product. You would do DC offset null. You do GSM jammer uh, rejection. You do harmonic rejection test. So what we found was that, uh, you know, what did we achieve without BIST, you know, if we did a conventional testing, and what did we achieve with BIST? What was the test time reduction ratio? And most of our tests did very well. In fact, you know, we found that about 77% of the test time could be substituted with BIST, but there are always some tests that you cannot replace with BIST, right? So they will add to the test cost. And we showed uh, that, you know, based on our calculations for our chip, the BIST actually made the silicon area shrink by 34%. Shrink is, you know, within quotes, this means that the cost of saving uh, in the price was equivalent to shrinking the silicon area by 34%. It's not that we really shrunk the silicon. So now, very quickly, I'm going to show you. Uh, this is a description of you know what what I spoke about is a full commercial product implementation of a, a pretty detailed RF analog built-in self-test system. So what happens in millimeter waves? What is different? So all of you, you know, um, I think many of you may have seen this cartoon, which essentially says that you know it hurts to do low frequency design, but it it hurts a lot if you're trying to do high frequency design. Why? Because the transistor at high frequencies, uh, you know, is no longer what it used to be at low frequencies. You know, when you study analog design, you say that the transistor is essentially a transconductor, right? Uh, then when you go to reasonably low frequency design, you add the gate to source capacitance and maybe you put in the Miller cap. Then as you go to millimeter wave frequencies, you find every little lead that you have to the device, every piece of wire now ends up being a non-ideal resistor or a parasitic capacitor. So what we have found is that the parasitics are making it harder and harder to design these things reliably at high frequencies. Another thing is that you know the FTs um, have been going up. Uh, those of you who are not uh, familiar with what's an FT, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, very simply speaking, the frequency at which the current gain goes to one, right? And it's a very good measure of uh, till what point is a device active and provides gain. And today we can get FTs very easily up to 400 gigahertz. In fact, you know, if you look at these two top two curves, those of you, you know, who've done 3.5 design know that traditionally we've liked gallium arsenide because the FTs were very high, mainly driven by the mobility, right, of these materials. But in the last decade or so, uh, both silicon germanium and CMOS have rapidly caught up on the FT front, right? And this has really enabled us to do millimeter wave and today even terahertz, right? And so if you look at an amplifier at very high frequencies, you know that uh, you essentially, um, you know, have um, 
you know, capacitors uh, which determine the high frequency response, right? And so uh, most RF parameters that we are interested in, such as gain, noise figure, they're correlated directly to FT. In fact, you can derive relations. Uh, so if you look at a low noise amplifier, a conventional low noise amplifier, you would probably have two stages of cascodes with inductors and a bunch of capacitors coupling, um, coupling various stages and so on. When you move to millimeter wave frequencies, you'll find at least these three things will happen. One, the F0 over FT will degrade, right? So typically what happens is that the frequency of operation F0 is kept at a comfortable fraction of the FT. If you have a 100 gigahertz FT device, you want F0 to be about 10 gigahertz, so that this ratio is about one tenth. Now, unfortunately, this ratio becomes one fifth or one third as you move to millimeter wave frequencies because you cannot push the FT as high. So as a circuit designer, your challenge now is how do you deal with that situation? The second thing is every inductor starts behaving like a little bit of a capacitor, right? And every capacitor starts behaving a little bit like an inductor. So they become non-ideal. And the third thing is that all the transmission lines now start showing distributed effects, right? And so the whole testing process now has to comprehend this. Uh, people in the last decade or so have built a lot of these amplifiers. In my group, we haven't had much of a good experience with distributed um, transmission line based amplifiers. We still like um, lumped element based amplifiers, but you know, uh, distributed amplifiers would typically look like this. And you know, everything is a transmission line, right? So the other challenge is if you're talking about testing, right? Do you first package your die? You know, in a system like this, for example, you know, uh, when I was at Intel, we looked at this flip chip ball grid array package, right, where we would put the flip chip on top and then assemble it like this. Remember, this is, as you go vertically up, you had a lot of parasitics. Today, people are taking the silicon die and putting it straight on the PCB in what's known as a wafer scale package, right? But even there, you have challenges because the bumps will add a lot of capacitance. You can get rid of the inductance. On the other hand, you know, like they say, pick your poison, right? So you either pick your poison to be the capacitor or the inductor. If you do a conventional wire bond, then you have to have lots of inductance that you have to deal with. And at millimeter wave frequencies, this gets much worse. Now, the other option is, of course, to test on a wafer, and this would allow you to, you know, we do this routinely. This would allow you to get very accurate results. Uh, but then, you know, how do you deal with the issues that you face when you assemble it in a package, right? So there are lots of other challenges, right, related to tuners, cables, hardware. I won't go into this. So the question is, how do people do millimeter wave testing today and where do we see the future headed? So I'll show you a couple of implementations. One of the implementations that I personally really like is what came out of UCSD. And uh, I'll show you what they did. This is a 16 element phased array, right? Uh, at 76 to 84 gigahertz. I'm assuming this was design designed for automotive applications. Now, if you look at the system, what they have done is, you know, if you go back and look at what we did at Qualcomm uh, 10 years ago, or more than that, we tapped into specific nodes to see if we could measure voltages or signals at those uh, nodes, right? Uh, now, um, this act of connecting to nodes adds capacitance, as you will know, because when you connect a switch, the connecting end of the switch has the drain to, so drain to bulk capacitance, right? So the other option, as we microwave and millimeter wave people love to say, is the use of couplers, right? Why not use directional couplers? So this is what this technique does because this is more of a millimeter wave chip, right? So what they have done is very simple. You know, they have in this chip, you can see there are these receiver chains. Each one of these chains is going in here. You know, they have these Wilkinson combiners. And then, you know, finally this comes in and this is the baseband output. They mix it down and they have the baseband output here. Now they added BIST. What they did was their local oscillator that went up here was also tapped in here, right? Through a BIST switch. And then this was pushed into all of these channels, each of these phased array channels, as you can see, a transmission line was pushed in here. And then, which means that they could inject a BIST signal through each of these receivers. Look at the output here and so the BIST is not interested in what happens in this path, which is the path of the main receiver. The BIST is interested in tapping into the signal here. And this is again done with a directional coupler. And then you couple the signal back in here, use another coupler. And at this point, you either measure the, the RF or you convert the RF 
through an envelope detector to DC and measure the DC, just like we had done in the Qualcomm chip, right? You could measure the RF or you could measure the DC, uh, but then the coupling, the act of coupling the signal itself is a little complex. So the way they did it was not to use switches. What they did was that, you know, when they had this distribution through which they coupled the signal into each of these best parts, they coupled it with a capacitor, which was essentially made by using a passive arrangement. So the best line you can see are these two lines, they're running this way. Uh, they were carrying the signal that was coupled in. And then you had these capacitors that were made by taking vias and metal pieces. And these were these are linear passive capacitors, right? And much smaller than the drain capacitors that we would get from a MOS device. And this is how you can couple this in. And this is the main line through which you can couple the signal to do a best measurement. So this is one way in which you can actually do it. Of course, this system is not as involved as the system that I showed you in a product because the product system has to take care of cost aspects and you know various things. It has to have a digital interface. So perhaps you could now, in the millimeter wave regime, you could come up with a combination of the best of these two approaches. If you are you know, building a full-blown millimeter wave best system on a chip, uh, then you could possibly borrow from many of the ideas that we used in the Qualcomm chip, but at the same time, now you could possibly use more millimeter wave light techniques, more conventional microwave techniques, the use of things like Wilkinson dividers, Wilkinson combiners, and you know, uh, couplers, and so on. And uh, this would end up uh, resulting in a much more efficient and industrially uh, applicable chip. I'll conclude with um, you know one last example. I mean, this is my last example of uh, best, how to do best. And this was again from a very recent paper, I think two years ago, uh, from Bell Labs, where they showed that you know you could again take um, you know multiple element phased array, and you could tap into various points and do monitoring. And again, if you want details, you can look at this paper. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to you know go into detail. But they used, um, you know, calibration memory, self-diagnostics, lookup tables. This is looking more and more like the built-in self-test um, system of the future, where the system will end up testing itself. Okay, you will have to do the least amount of work, and perhaps in the next decade or so, systems will make liberal use of artificial intelligence. So I'll just list out at the end the challenges. Um, so we are going to see many more complex systems in the coming days: multi-band, multi-mode radios phased arrays and uh, MIMO systems, and we have to make greater utilization of the on-chip capacity. Uh, one thing that people are again looking at is, can we do a lot of this using numerical techniques and algorithms? Can we use error correction algorithms, you know, to use the, the best system that we can put on a chip, which is not the best best system in the world in terms of accuracy, because you cannot put a spectrum analyzer or a VNA inside a chip. But can we use all the wealth of knowledge that exists in the fields of DSP and you know other allied fields that help with error correction and coding theory, for example, uh, and uh, can we integrate a large number of RF tests, right? Like linearity, SNR, time domain measurements using these things. Um, we are also looking actively at DC to output correlation. This is extremely difficult. Can you just by measuring DC nodes predict the RF performance of the chip, right? But it's a very interesting research problem. Companies still don't trust this too much. Now, can we integrate CAD, millimeter wave CAD with BEST? You know, can we simulate and test and uh, tie these together, right? There, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this area. And uh, we can use fuses to do uh, yield improvement. We could do continuous calibration, lifetime correction. How do we take care of a millimeter wave or RF chip that degrades over its lifetime? Can we keep correcting its performance? And ca can we keep monitoring its health? And can we perhaps use AI to do that in the coming days, right? And eventually the goal is to design millimeter wave radios that will test themselves without you know, any help from us. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you very much, Dr. Gaurav Banerjee. Indeed, that was a very interesting talk and a very information, informative one at that. I'm sure that all the participants uh, really had a good learning experience. And uh, I think now we have just a few minutes to open the floor for questions. To streamline the questions, it would be good if you can, the participants who have questions can uh, put it in the chat box and I can 
summarize them or Dr. Banerjee can take a look at that and uh, give his answers. There has been one question uh, where the, the question is on, there is a gap between academia and industry in IC testing. Are there any initiatives going on in bridging the gap in this domain? So, uh, so would you like to answer? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. I think this is a very, very interesting question because, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, perhaps in the field of testing, the gap is more stark because of one reason that um, it takes a lot of infrastructure to actually be able to test a chip, right? Uh, it took me almost half a decade to build the capability we have at ISC. And it is still not something that people would use in the industry for high volume tests. So I think this is the reason the gap exists. Uh, people are working hard to reduce this gap. One way for uh, professors to do this would actually be to not try and do this in their labs, right? Because <laughs> we are very tempted to do these kinds of things in our labs, but high volume testing is really an industrial operation. So what we need to do essentially is to tie up with the relevant industrial groups, you know, through various forums. Um, nowadays in India, the international test conference is being held every single year. And we have some really bright people in the various companies uh, in our Indian ecosystem uh, who are helping build the test ecosystem in India. So at the very least, you could, uh, you know, if you're in academia, you could go to the ITC every year in the ITC India. Uh, and typically it's in Bangalore every summer. And you can interact with all these people. You can tell them, I have this great idea, but I don't have a high volume tester. I'd like to collaborate with you. And I think this is the way to build this infrastructure in India, uh, the ecosystem in India. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. There's another question uh, in the chat box. Uh, the question reads like this in millimeter wave design lot uh, there are a lot of challenges in phase array design do you think machine learning will help in optimization uh this is a good question i you know i don't really have a clear answer for you because uh, in my group we have just started playing with some some aspects of machine learning so i you know i cannot really tell you in great detail if you're looking at conventional uh, machine learning approaches like reinforcement learning for example uh, you know, uh, one of the things is that you need tremendous amounts of data, right, to be able to train your AI. Uh, perhaps you can use a combination of mathematical models that predict the behavior of the system and do limited training. And, uh, you know, then eventually as data comes online, you can keep training it. In the future, definitely, yes. You know, in the short term, I'm not so sure. I think more of the conventional microwave wisdom has to prevail over the short term. Uh, but over the long term, perhaps, uh, you know, it's going to be a combination of machine learning as, you know, we get more and more data in and train our AIs. Thank you, sir. So are there any other questions? Um, maybe we have time for one. With uh, permission from Dr. Manuel, the session chair, I just want comments yes dr chennai please yeah firstly <laughs> thank you uh, dr banji for accepting the invitation to the virtual podium uh, at the location so for so uh, yeah thank you and uh, as you know as i talk to you over phone we are doing uh, this kind of activities over the entire um, lockdown period starting um, March, April, etc. And uh, this is the last event of the year. So we are really privileged to have you as one of the speakers. So uh, I don't have technical question. The, I mean, I just want to know on the modality. So some of the bright students uh, from you. So they want to do some kind of internship work or uh, some kind of uh, short term project work for which uh, so most of the institutes doesn't have enough infrastructure especially in the domain so can you just uh, mention the points like how to approach and whether there are any uh, chances to do some work uh, under the guidance uh, of uh, your group Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sao, first of all, for uh, inviting me. Uh, 
and um, uh, it's uh, it's been a great uh, experience presenting to your institute. Um, I, in terms of answering your question, I think you know we end up mainly with time commitment issues. I don't think it's a question of you know how many can we take and so on. You know because I, on one hand, it's important that people should do internships, but I think. Uh, people should really do these in the industry. This is just my opinion, because I think what the feedback that we get from people, you know, I deal a lot with the industry. I work very closely with them. The feedback that I get is that, you know, the students could really do with some industrial exposure, right? Now, in India, I see that there is a big culture of students writing to academic institutes to do internships. Now, unless they are, you know, deeply into research and that is what they would like to do, it doesn't make sense. And we also have to remember that all groups pretty much have the same kinds of time limitations. So it probably makes more sense to apply to the industry. Uh, the I would say the IEEE itself would be a very good venue to bring in these people from the industry. You know, uh, perhaps a small group can be formed of people from the industry and, uh, you know, they can be approached. My opinion is that an industrial internship is way more valuable than you know, somebody coming to my group and learning a few things, uh, which some of which may not even be relevant, you know, uh, as opposed to working in an industrial group. Right. I, I do agree uh, partially. We have a similar kind of channel, uh, the way you mentioned that uh, doing some short term internship and then some of those uh, companies are even interested to convert those internship into final year project. In fact, uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, is one of the persons who is taking care of that part in our institute. Okay, thanks a lot. And maybe we can talk about this offline. Yeah, 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 sure. So, thank Dr. you Emmanuel, you may all. please conclude the session. Yes. Thanks once again to all the, uh, first of all, to the speaker, Dr. Gaurav Banerjee. Thank you very much, sir, for your, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was quite informative. BIST in analog and RF is really not an area which is very popular in India to begin with. And 